order. Um, now I'm going to go to another one of the records, also correlation detector. Um, and they're, let's see, we have a sample of them. Yeah, a series of detectors coming up. Uh, I probably won't get through them all today. It's kind of what's on the schedule, but I think there'll be plenty of time and, you know, to finally get through this one today. Even um, I think it's going to be good for, for tomorrow. We'll see what we'll be able to do. There'll be enough time to do what we need to do. So, spectrogram correlation, what is it? Uh, it is. Sorry. Um, it's a way of uh, matching a template of a call to a spectrogram um, and having the uh, template um, pick up certain shapes, certain frequency contours in the spectrogram. So this is a recording of um, two bright well calls um, from 100 hertz up to 100 hertz. Um, it's a frequency sweep that goes up um, just over a couple seconds or so. I made a template for it that looks like this. Um, uh, it has a central part that's dark in this, in this image, um, where the, the template is positive, and then it's surrounded by these flanking bands that are white, or it's negative. Um, the white flanking bands help reject noise, uh, interfering noise, uh, in the spectrogram from during the detection. Um, and uh, by taking this template and kind of sliding it along and matching it up, not um, multiplying automatically, um, you get a detection function, which looks like this. Um, and it ends up having very nice high peaks where the call is present, and very low stuff where the call is not present. Um, uh, the shape of this um, kernel, the, the, the simulated call, is with the positive parts and the flanking negative parts is, uh, was originally inspired by the function of some neurons in your auditory pathway in the auditory cortex that are sensitive to sounds that sweep in a certain direction, um, but that reject sounds that are uh, nearby to the, to the sweeping sound, um, uh, similar, similarly to the way that this, this kernel is designed. Um, another, so this is a kernel is designed for this right whale call. Um, 100 hertz to 200 hertz kind of sound. Um, another example, uh, hit whale one that I wrote about on paper. Um, these are bowhead whale end notes from, the, from a bowhead whale song recorded up in the Arctic, up in the north slope of Alaska. Uh, this is the carnival that's designed to detect them. Again, it's got a positive central part and a neg these negative flanking parts. Um, and here's the detection function that resulted from that. Um, with nice high peaks where the, where the calls are present and uh, low values elsewhere. Uh, so that's how a spectrogram correlator uh, functions. And let's look at how it works in Ishmael. Here we are. Uh, so, uh, let's see an example. So let's open this um, blue whale demonstration. Um, blue whale demo, the, the one that has noise in it. Uh, oh, here's the palate cleanser first. So here is Ishmael. Um, load settings and choose your Ishmael factory settings. Uh, and then open this blue whale file. It's in the um, S-gram correlation directory. Use the one that says plus noise um, for this exercise. Uh, so there's my spectrogram. Not a very good one. First thing I want to do is make it a little brighter. Okay. I'm not seeing the blue whale call very well, so I'm going to um, change my spectrogram parameters. Uh, 
uh, you see these blue oil calls. Um, they have a, a first a fundamental down here at about I don't know, 18 hertz in this case, and then a second harmonic that you can barely see, a third harmonic that's fairly bright, a fifth harmonic that's fairly bright, a fourth harmonic that you can kind of barely see. And here I simulated uh, a noise source that's getting louder and louder, like you would see for an approaching ship or something like that. This sound file is about a little over half an hour long. Uh, one hour is 3,600 seconds. This is 1,800 seconds. Um, uh, so this noise source is growing in, in volume gradually. You can see the, you know, the background noise get louder and louder. Um, first thing I want to do is um, try to compensate for that changing level of background noise. So I'm going to turn on spectrogram equalization. Um, the time, time constant here, I want something that's several times as long as the call. I have to know these blue oil calls that are 5 to 10 seconds long, so I'm going to use 30 seconds. Um, which is maybe an overestimate of what I need to do. And then here.
uh, spectrogram correlation is a kind of detection that works really well when <coughs> the calls are pretty stereotyped. So these blue oil, blue oil calls look almost identical to one another. If you look at this third harmonic here, that one, that one, that one. You know, there are little variations, but you know, the start frequency is almost always the same. The time it takes to bounce sweep is almost the same. The end frequency is almost the same. Um, uh, it, it, it works pretty well. It works very well when they're when the calls are this stereotype. It probably wouldn't work very well on a dolphin whistle, a humpback call, I mean a humpback song, or something like that, where there's a huge amount of variety to it. Um, but for these kind of sounds, it works. It works really well. A lot of the baleen whales um, have very stereotyped calls, and also um, a lot of animals that have complex song will have other kinds of calls that are not. Um, they're, they're very stereotyped. So, for instance, humpback whales have about a repertoire of more than a dozen different kinds of um, social calls that they'll, they'll use with one another, and those calls tend to be much more stereotyped. And they, don't, they don't change over time the way the, uh, the song units do, and so those are good targets for this kind of detector. If you're looking at humpback social communication, um, for this kind of detector is good to use. Uh, okay. Um, now I want to uh, look into another aspect, which is um, uh, in, uh, looking at your detected calls, and, um, uh, checking your detection, detected calls. So under detection options, go to saving calls on the menu, and click on edit the action. This, one, this time we're not going to set up login, we're going to say save the selection as a new sound file. And so whenever it makes a detection, that becomes the selection. And when I check that box, it means it's going to save this, the, the detected call as a new sound file. Um, click over here on the Saving Files tab. I want to save, I want to specify where to save those calls. Um, and I'm going to save them in the spectrogram correlation directory because that's I think a directory I'm allowed to write it to. We have permission to write to that directory. Unclear. <laughs> Unclear, but I hope so. Save a new directory on the same Yeah. I also want to specify the names for my sound files. So I'm going to use. Those sound files, it has a, a timestamp on it. Um, it 
when it um, opened the file, it uh, tried to figure out when in the world that file was recorded. Um, if the, the, uh, the timestamp is part of the file name, it, it, you can have it pick up that timestamp in the file name. Uh, some of the sound file formats that it can read um, have internal times that are, that are written inside them to specify when, when a sound file was recorded. If you don't have either of those, which is the case here, you can specify um, when the sound file starts. And so I'm going to go with the same file, so I can cancel that. But I go to um, on the open file menu, I go to timestamps. Um, so I'm going to say this started at, in this case, today it doesn't matter uh, because I'm measuring my um, output sound file name has the number of seconds in, in the day that, that the file started. Um, so, but, if, but how, if I, the time does matter, and the time zone matters. I'm using the same time zone here that I used for output, so the time zones match, and my time starts at zero. And now, I think I should get times that indicate, yeah, where in the file these detections occurred. So here I have 00047, so that means there's a detection of 47 seconds, this one here. 200 seconds, this one's at 304 seconds, my second sound file, 342 seconds, this is one here, uh, the next one is 571 seconds, which is this one here, all there. Um, so I've got one sound file for each detection. I can have, one of the options is to have Ishmael uh, put that sound file name in the log, if you like, um, so you can have it, you can actually have it just um, log the, the time of your um, the time of the detection, the, the real time of the detection, if you like, by doing that by having to write a sound file and, and having the um, uh, the real time incorporated in the sound file machine. Now, if I want to look at these detections, you know, find out that there's, uh, there's something I need to correct. You know, but let's let's look at them. Um, so. Save settings as default. We don't want to come back to this detector in a minute. And um, you know, open some of these files. So let's open the first one. That's good. I want to turn off my detector because I want to run the sound file without doing more detection. And if I look at the sound file, there it is. Same spectrogram settings, but now it's <coughs> stretched out a whole bunch horizontally because I took this 25 second file and get it to the same window that I formerly had half an hour's worth of sound. <coughs> um, so time is way stretched out horizontally compared to what it was before. Here's the call, it goes off the end. Uh, the reason for that is remember I put 10 seconds of buffering before the call and 10 seconds after the call. Um, uh, with spectrogram correlation, the peak in the detection function occurs at the very start of the call. And this, in this case, the call started around 10 seconds and the um, detection function went up and then came back down. Um, uh, and um, so I need, what I need to do to fix this, to be able to see all of this call, is to change my buffer time. Um, I have too much sound before the call and not enough after it. I'm going to go back to my original detector. I'm going to reload. I'm going to reload my detector. I saved it as default before, so I'm going to quit and start it.
there it is. Oh, I left it detected on. Uh, well, you can see here's here's the blue whale call. Here you can see how the spectrogram correlation function uh, has a peak right close to where the where the call starts. It starts at about you know I have 10 seconds of buffer time, which is when this goes over threshold. And um, um, the 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 um, peak comes right at the start of the call, not any time later. That's just the way the spectrogram correlator, correlator works. So here's my blue whale call. Uh, let me turn off the detector. Which I can only left on. Um, so uh, I'm not running the detector anymore. And now I can look at these blue whale calls. So that's the that's what a blue whale B calls. It looks like it's a protection bit. And yeah. um, yeah. since I'm the now looking at calls, I'm gonna when I said I was running a detector, I'm gonna add could be some zero padding and some smaller outsides to smooth it out a little bit. Uh, so that's what a blue whale call looks like. That long 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 long. Um, yeah, so it's probably Check that 
about the Japan that, uh, so you don't really see very much. You know, that kind of batch run is for processing files, like running a detector or something. It's not for viewing things very much. Here it is again. Ooh. One second to process all 12 files, so I didn't get to see a whole lot. All um, after each file. Yeah. And then down, the down and up uh, arrows. Yeah, lots of stuff. As you're flipping, is there any kind of hot key like part of yes, no, yes? Yes, there is. Good question. You're a plant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'll open a log file. I'm going to use it. 
text log file. Check the box that says use a log file. I'll let me choose the name of my log file. Put in correlation. And I call this one and we'll check log.
start doing a correlation kernel, I just need to know what the frequency is here, the frequency is here, and how long it lasts. So that's low, low frequency, high frequency, and durational. Okay. And then I'm going to draw boxes around the ball and make measurements. So here's the first ball. Yeah. Uh, if 
you do that, how does it deal with sort of the negative space within those bounds? Like, let's say I have a call of three harmonics, but then I put it in the front door for the bottom and the top harmonic. Is that going to? Then stuff in the middle won't get, won't affect it. It won't affect it. Right. If you remember. Like, when I picture that, that gray box, it's not considering the things in between the two contours. Um, yeah, so the gray here represents zero territory. Right. And so anything that the gray area does not affect, um, will, not, will not affect the output of the, not affect what the detection function turns out as. Stuff that hits the black part will tend to make the detection function positive. Stuff that hits the white part will tend to send it negative. Um, with frequency contours, sometimes you can have problems with a you know, call like this that has some other kind of sound that crosses over it. Um, but when the kernel, when that crosses over the kernel, it intersects both the positive and negative parts, and they cancel out. And so, you know, crossing stuff tends to have a have a zero impact on the detection function. It's a nice feature of it. Um, it's the stuff that lines up this axis of the detection of the kernel that um, has kind of gives you a nice strong piece like that. Is there a way to smooth those kernels for more curvy? Uh, no. Well, you could. Um, you have to do a whole bunch of you could yeah, short sections, yeah, yeah. Um, and and enter them in um, into the the uh, kernel dimension. Might be a bunch of feature requests as a question, but does that a lot of birds pitch modulate, and is it possible to do that and search, you know, frequency shifted up versus down um, without running a separate detector? No, uh, but there are tricks you can do, um, which I have done with Ray Whittle's a bunch. So let me show that Ray Whittle example again. Um, there. Basically, makes the width of the contour very Yeah, so what you can do, so Ray Whittle calls um, generally have a lower uh -huh. frequency, that, I mean, a, a bottom frequency. You know, the, the start of the call starts somewhere between. 50 and 120 hertz or something like that um, and sweep up. Um, what you can do is make a kernel that extends throughout that entire range. Um, not just the calls you see, but you know, have one that starts down lower and goes up higher. Uh, you need to change the duration of it by the corresponding amount because you want to have the same slope. That way a call occurring anywhere that matches your, you know, if it occurred here, it would match. If it occurred here, it would match. If it occurred there, it would match. Um, with your kernel. So you can sort of extend things that way. You can also um, make different angles match better by changing the kernel width. Um, so this is a very skinny kernel, and it's, um, it, it'll match something that has that, that angle pretty precisely, but if it changes the angle very much, it won't, you know, the, the sweep rate changes very much, it, it won't match anymore. But if I make the kernel width more, that allows for a lot more variation in how fast it's sweeping. So you can play with the numbers like that um, to accommodate more or less variation in the you know how, how stereotype the call is. Uh, there are, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, is there a way to clear the data log without closing the No. <laughs> this is a, a feature we need. Um, did you hear that? No. Way to clear the data log. Um, you wouldn't need it if people like me to mess up their selections the first time. Well, no, everybody. And also a way to remove the last item or remove a selected item from the data log if you, if you want to remeasure something. It's not turning over. Um, so, Dave, the kernel's sensitive to your spectrogram settings, then, right? You have to change the spectrogram settings and you have to change the kernel it's, or no? It's, it's it somewhat sensitive. <laughs> um, so, if you change your spectrogram setting, you know, if you make your frame size twice as long or something, so suddenly the, the pixel shape changes, um, it recalculates this kernel for the new spectrogram settings before it runs. So it'll still be the same slope and the same duration okay. and everything um, when you do that. Changing the spectrogram settings will change the what intersects with the kernel um, to some degree. And so um, it will change how the detector functions somewhat. But I found that, that spectrum correlation detector is not actually that sensitive to frame size or overlap or um, zero padding. All those things don't actually don't affect it. Don't affect how the, the difference in height between calls and non-calls. Um, it changes a little bit, but it doesn't change a whole lot. So if you're if you're trying to match the exact same type of 
spectrograms correlated with anything you did last year, then you want to have the exact same numbers. But if you're just trying to get you know, yeah, it's generally the same right. behavior out of your computer detector. Not, um, yeah, it doesn't, not, you, know, you don't have to have exactly the same settings as you, as you did before. Yeah, it's not clear to me how it uses but like I just do too. Any more questions about this one? So it's 4.45, Dave. Right. you guys open up this bottom sound file here, the blue demo one. Open the one that does not have noise in the name and try to make a uh, spectrogram correlation kernel for it. Is everybody having the problem save a data log? Yeah. So that's, that's everybody? Okay. Right. Yeah. No, it's not, it's not even open, but it's the save box.
you have reasonably good, good success at managing to make a kernel that makes the peaks pop out.
Um, so this is just something to be aware of when you're, if you're leaving your detector on while you're, while you're viewing individual calls, that Ishmael's using your call as a noise estimate. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's a track came off. I also wanted to show something here about quick, quick yeah, questions. On that. Yeah. Where, where can you set the time window for the normalization? Um, it's three times as long as your time constant for, for uh, equalization. So this number here, 15, Ishmael uses three times that long. So in the shorter file, it wasn't able to get that long and so it truncated it without you knowing it, or? Yeah, it didn't. I mean, if your file is shorter than 45 seconds, it would just use the entire file to, to um, in, in calculating its sort of average spectrum level. So, so in that case, it, but that call, but that, but you're showing 45 seconds right there, right? Yeah, or 46, yeah. So it shouldn't have, I don't understand why it was different then. Well, at each point in it, it's looking 30, or, oh, okay. you know, 20 seconds on each side. So you're doing the whole file for all of it instead of In this one, a there's a lot window. more time between the calls um, than, than 45 seconds. Right. Um, and, and more time before the first, well, I guess not before that call, but before these other calls. Um, and so uh, the amount of time that it's using to calculate the noise um, level, you know, it's basically using all this time to calculate the noise level before it gets to that, that first call. So more than 45 seconds? No, it, it'd still be 45 seconds. Um, I mean, it's an exponential decay process, so it actually extends right. back indefinitely far in the future. But um, uh, So the other one would have been okay if it was like 70 seconds long or something. It's just because the, the edges of it are truncated. Yeah, if I put more noise buffering time before the call, right. um, more than 45 seconds worth, um, I think it would have the, the it should be pretty right? much identical to right. what okay. we had uh, before. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? All right. Um, that pretty much wraps it up. Let's see. It's five. Oh, five, five. Um, five oh four. So uh, we're done for today, I guess. We'll, we'll move on to another detection pack tomorrow morning. Um, and I encourage you to uh, try things out. Oh, um, we're talking about um, trying to find somewhere to go to dinner tomorrow night after the, the end of the, the workshop for tomorrow. Um, how many people would be interested in doing that? I just want to get a head count. I want to make a reservation somewhere. Dinner after the class. Yes. Fifteen people. Okay. Would people prefer to be close to here? I don't know where we're staying. So. Yeah, because yeah. it's going to be raining, so anywhere, we don't want to go anywhere far. <laughs> <laughs> we usually go to Rock Bottom. Yeah, the ironic thing is, we're going to get stuck on the highway if we get anywhere on the highway. Rock Bottom. The other option is somewhere in down by Scripps, one of the. Places there, but they don't hold too many. Fifteen. Oh, like we down could, on. We could go and rent up there. So that's a little more pricey. Yeah, but so this is placing on top of the hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put a camera. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm not sure. Yeah, my The store of the big stand. It's going to be like sunny. Why is it